Today's episode is brought to you by the Daily Gardener Friday Newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast featuring garden history and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and today is March 23rd. Today in garden history, we celebrate the birth of John Bartram, the American botanist and explorer. He was born on this day, March 23rd, in 1699. John founded the first botanical garden in America, and Linnaeus called him, quote, the greatest natural botanist in the world. Like many botanists of his time, John was born to a farming Quaker family in Pennsylvania, and he never forgot his rural roots, and he always thought of himself as a farmer first. When asked how he ended up in botany, he once wrote, One day I was very busy plowing, and being weary, I ran under a tree to repose myself. I cast my eyes on a daisy, I plucked it mechanically, and viewed it with more curiosity than common country farmers are wont to do, and observed many distinct parts— some perpendicular, some horizontal. I thought about it continually, at supper, in bed, and wherever I went. And on the fourth day, I hired a man to plow for me and went to Philadelphia. I bought a Latin grammar book and applied to a neighboring schoolmaster who in three months taught me Latin enough to understand Linnaeus. And then I began to botanize all over my farm. And it was on this day, back in 1907, that a school garden for boys was started at a school in Rhode Island. A summary report was published with the State Board of Education, and here's what the report said. On March 26th, all the boys wrote for catalogs, some sending several letters or cards. It proved a valuable lesson in letter writing and geography as they had to look at the places they had sent the letters and then inquire about distances, railroads, and mail trains. More than 50 attractive catalogs were received, and the seeds were obtained through a member of Congress. And despite all the rumors regarding the poor quality of government seed, they proved excellent. Two boys found an old sink in a dump, and this was sunk in the middle of the west yard, partly filled with cement and now used as a bird bath. There have been many difficulties for the boys. Most of the work has been done outside of school hours, at noon when some of the boys have to hurry home, or at night when they carry the papers. Most discouraging of all, vegetables have been stolen and the gardens tramped on almost nightly. But the effect of the garden work on the boys has been excellent. First of all, it's given them an outside interest. They have learned courtesy and generosity and showing visitors the garden and giving away their vegetables. Toads, which we have raised from eggs, are to be put in the garden when school closes. There has been less time for running about the streets and cigarette smoking. And since the gardens were started, there's only been one case of truancy and very little absence. 10 or 15 minutes of hard work during school hours has often served to bring a cross, restless boy back to quiet and pleasant. Of the 23 boys, 18 have made gardens at home, and most of them are doing well. And today is the birthday of James C. Rose, an American landscape architect and author who was born on this day, March 23rd, back in 1913. A high school dropout, James was expelled from Harvard University as a landscape architecture major because they didn't approve of his design style. 
Well, in spite of his personal struggles with educational institutions, James fulfilled a lifelong dream when he created the James Rose Center for Design Study and Landscape Research. In his 1958 book, From Creative Gardens, James wrote, A garden is an experience. It is not flowers or plants of any kind. It is not flagstone, brick, grass, or pebbles. It is not a barbecue or a fiberglass screen. It is an experience. If it were possible to distill the essence of a garden, I think it would be the sense of being within something while still out of doors. That is the substance of it. For until you have that, you do not have a garden at all. And today we also celebrate the birth of the English cartoonist Norman Thelwell, who was born on this day, March 23rd in 1923. Norman is remembered for his humorous drawings of ponies and horses, but in his 1978 book called From a Plank Bridge by a Pool, Norman wrote these words. When I look at the tree in the dark days of winter, its huge green-black skeleton silhouetted against the ashen sky, or hear its tracery seething in a westerly gale as I lie snug and warm in bed, I wonder who it was planted this giant for so many generations to enjoy. And in the balmy days of summer, when its leaves are overlaid like the breast feathers of a great bird to form high domes of rounded foliage, I wish I could call back this gentle spirit of the past and say, This is your tree. Look at it now, for it is gracious beyond words. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Cook's Herb Garden by Jeff Cox and Marie Pierre Moyne. This book came out in 2010, and the subtitle is Grow, Harvest, Cook. Well, as someone who loves to grow herbs, this is one of my favorite books on herbs because it features beautiful photography of over 120 culinary herbs, and then it offers up more than 30 delicious practical recipes that show you what you can do with your herbs. Everything from making your own salad dressings and marinades to flavored butter, pestos, herbal teas, and cordials, in addition to seasoning your favorite meals. And I love what Jeff writes. He says, I always think of culinary herbs as the champions of the kitchen garden. And he reminds us that their volatile oils serve a purpose. They were the compounds that plants used to defend themselves from insects and fungi. As for Marie, she says that as a cook, Herbs are my best friends. Just a handful brightens up the concoctions that I make in my kitchen. And she also reminds us that when space is at a premium, herbs should be a priority. So whether you're going to store some ginger root in the freezer or a roll of herb butter or even just a little cilantro ice cube, they are all well worth their shelf space. This book is 192 pages of fantastic herbs, and the photography is top-notch. This is a DK book, and it looks like it. You can get a used copy of The Cook's Herb Garden by Jeff Cox and Marie-Pierre Moyne, and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $4, and that's a great price. But make sure if you want to get a copy at that price that you act quickly because I know they'll go very fast. All right, finally, we end today's show with a botanic spark that remembers the British-American actress Elizabeth Taylor, who died on this day, March 23rd in 2011. Elizabeth was the highest paid movie star in the 1960s, and she won two Academy Awards for Butterfield 8 and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. 
Elizabeth was an early AIDS activist. She founded the National AIDS Research Foundation, and in 1990, she championed the Ryan White Care Act to stop discrimination against people with HIV. And one of the things that she did was to send lavender-scented notes to senators and members of Congress, and her note simply said, I think you should see this along with detailed information about HIV. Elizabeth's garden at her home in Bel Air was located behind the swimming pool, and it was a private tropical paradise and featured her favorite flowers, gardenias and lilies of the valley, along with birds of paradise. Tucked beneath lush palms and bamboo, Elizabeth also had a small greenhouse that held her collection of orchids. In 1987, Elizabeth was one of the very first celebrities to launch a signature fragrance, White Diamonds. And her garden was the muse for White Diamonds, which is made up of Italian narrowly, Egyptian tuberose, Narcissus, and Turkish rose. And this fragrance, by the way, has generated more than 1.5 billion in sales. And to this day, Revlon reports that four bottles of white diamonds are sold every minute in the United States. In 2004, Elizabeth's mobility declined, and she stopped taking her daily walks through her beloved garden. She died on this day in 2011 at the age of 79 from congestive heart failure. And Elizabeth left instructions for her funeral service. She wanted it to start 15 minutes late, as she wanted to be late for her own funeral. Well, that's it for today's show. Just remember that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. The next time you're over at Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. And if you'd like more of The Daily Gardener, you can subscribe to the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget that you can also show your support for the show by using the Buy Me a Coffee link over at the website or in today's show notes. This is Jennifer Ebling. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day.